Hey, welcome back all you learners out there again. Uh, this is a continuation of the uh, roles of the president uh, lecture that you've already seen. Uh, but really what I want to talk about now are what are the formal powers of the president uh, as outlined in Article 2 uh, of the Constitution. Not necessarily uh, all the power he has, he certainly wields a lot more than just what is in Article 2. So let's dive in and get started. Some of this is a little review. Uh, if we look at Article 2, the formal powers of the president reside there. Um, those are the enumerated powers of the presidency. Uh, and so the president operates within the confines of his interpretation or his legal counsel's interpretation uh, of Article 2 of the Constitution. That, of course, runs into uh, some trouble uh, throughout American history. But uh, then that is up to the United States Supreme Court to decide whether or not a president has acted within the boundaries of Article 2 uh, as outlined. If we look, the one that we're most familiar with is the president as commander-in-chief, uh, commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy, and then de facto now uh, the other armed forces that we have. Um, his responsibility is to commission all officers. Uh, so to get a commission as an officer is an honor uh, given by the president. Um, the president is also the commander-in-chief of the state militias, when they are called up to national duty. The National Guard is under the leadership and purview of the governor of each state, but when they, uh, when the president calls the National Guard uh, into national service, he is then the commander-in-chief. Uh, one of probably the greatest honors the president has the ability to give uh, are the uh, congressional commendations, uh, as you see in the picture, uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, which is the highest achievement, the highest reward, sorry, the highest award uh, a soldier can get uh, from the President of the United States. This was uh, one of the most recent ceremonies um, of the President giving the Medal of Honor. A question I want you to consider, and we'll talk about this in class, so be ready for this, is why did the framers want a civilian, the President of the United States, to be Commander-in-Chief? There, was, there were reasons why they, they saw that as an important uh, element to include in Article 2. Be ready to talk about that in class. Another formal power goes along with the roles that we talked about uh, is the chief executive uh, to carry out the laws, faithfully execute, as the president says in the oath of office, uh, the laws of the United States. Uh, but also, as chief executive, has the right to grant pardons for federal offenses, except in the cases of impeachment, that relies on Congress, uh, but has the power to grant those pardons. Uh, and something I want you to uh, be thinking about is how much power does that give the president? Well, you know, in a lot of ways, we like that idea because the president ceremonially pardons a turkey every Thanksgiving. Uh, political pardons also can be very, very those pardons can also be politically motivated, uh, but those pardons also can be uh, controversial. Uh, Bill Clinton, upon exiting office, pardoned hundreds of people, cocaine dealers, uh, major political donors, um, even, his, uh, his, even his brother. Uh, and the question was, well, how did he get all of that information? What kind of favors were they calling in? Uh, and no president is immune to this. At the end of George W. Bush's term, uh, as you can see from the political cartoon, a lot of people were, were expecting him to pardon many members of his staff uh, in the White House staff, uh, especially within um, the decisions that went into going to war uh, and the war on terrorism and such. So every president in the modern day uh, deals with that. But Think of the political reasons, the political ramifications, uh, but also the checks and balances issues that we have to look at. We'll examine that a little bit in class uh, as we go forward. That's a question I do want you to think about. Why did the framers give that power to the president? Why did they write the power to pardon, the power to commute sentences, the power to grant clemency? Why did they give that uh, to the president? Also, how do we reconcile this power with the principles of our Constitution? How does it reconcile with separation of powers, checks and balances, legal jurisprudence, the way our system operates in the, in the 
legal system. And then how has this power mixed with political ends in modern history? Look up some examples. Be ready to cite some in class. Another part of the chief executive power is to nominate judges of the Supreme Court uh, with the consent of the Senate uh, and to fill vacancies that happen during the recesses of the Senate. Um, this is becoming more and more controversial. Uh, a president's legacy uh, is not just four years or eight years. A president's legacy is as long as his judicial nominees are in the courts, be it the lower courts or, most importantly, probably at the Supreme Court. Uh, and I wanted to put some data out there for you. Uh, you can see the blue line is the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, which is the mid-level court right before the Supreme Court, and then the U.S. District Courts, which are the court of first jurisdiction in our legal system. Uh, but as you can see, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, most of those nominees, the vast majority of those nominees, were, um, were approved uh, by the Senate and sent on to the court. But if you look at our trend line here, uh, and if this is our trend line, you can see that those nominees uh, are, are moving quite lower than uh, where they once were. And that, of course, is because of our political process. Uh, and a Senate that's divided, uh, or a Senate that doesn't like the president is of opposing parties. Um, but that, again, contributes to the, the gridlock that we're seeing. Uh, within our system. One of the other formal powers, like I said, is to receive ambassadors, to appoint ambassadors, and also to make treaties with the, uh, the Senate as well. We call this the advice and consent power that the President shares with the Senate. That's an important uh, piece that, that emerges out of the Constitutional Convention. We spoke also as the president as chief legislator, we talked about the State of the Union address, making sure the Congress knows his perspective, but also then offers his pieces of legislation. Uh, and the president can also, as chief legislator, convene both House and Congress. If we look at that, the president has called Congress into special session 27 times uh, all throughout history, going all the way back to Madison, uh, calling Congress into session for the War of 1812, Lincoln calling him into, uh, into session um, to deal with the separating of the southern states, FDR calling him into special session right after his election to pass the legislation for his first 100 days. Uh, the 20th Amendment sets the process in place more formally, uh, and since the passage of the 20th Amendment, the president has only called into special session four times, twice FDR, uh, to deal with legislation of the New Deal, uh, and also to uh, affirm uh, the Neutrality Acts of World War II, uh, but then also Truman did it two times, uh, where he was in conflict with Congress uh, quite directly. Going along with that chief legislator power is the power of the presidential veto. Uh, the president, as you learn from how a bill becomes a law, uh, has to send a veto message to the passing house uh, of origin within 10 days. Uh, the president can ignore it, but it becomes law, uh, or can pocket veto, which means the president doesn't sign it within those 10 days uh, and Congress adjourns. Uh, or if the president vetoes, the Congress can override that veto with two-thirds majority from both houses. Quite difficult in our divided government, but has been done uh, before. Oftentimes, though, the veto is a threat, uh, and it's used as a political tool. Uh, it's very difficult for Congress to override that. Only about 4% of the time are they able to do it. But the, simp the mere threat of a veto, knowing that that legislation is dead on the president's desk when it arrives, causes Congress to negotiate with the president to make those changes. So in that way, the veto power is a, a check and a balance within the system. Those are the formal powers of the president as outlined in Article 2. Uh, join us on our YouTube channel to learn a little bit more about the executive as we move forward.